Got a cappuccino and a latte. Cappuccino, latte. Hello, this is The Food Chain. I'm Emily Thomas, and this episode is a buzzkill. For many, taking the punch out of the most widely consumed psychoactive substance on the planet really defeats the point. Decaffeinated coffee, a man once said, is kind of like kissing your sister. You're not judging me there. Yeah. <laughs> so are you the one that comes in with, like feeling really yeah, unsure yeah, of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like there's some projection going on. You're standing in a queue and there's all these people behind you waiting for their coffee and then you order the decaf and they think, well, why am I waiting behind you? You're only drinking decaf. You probably shouldn't be holding up the queue with that. I think you need to talk to someone about... <laughs> <laughs> but do I? British journalist Lucy Mangan once wrote that decaffeination takes place to accommodate the self-indulgent witterings of morons. Decaf drinkers, she says, probably think that ingesting a few micrograms of the mildest stimulant known to man is akin to injecting eight gallons of crystal meth into your eyeball and following it with a heroin chaser. Now, crystal meth isn't my thing, but good strong coffee always was. So it was with a heavy heart earlier this year that I decided to accept that coffee, which I love for its smell and taste, doesn't love me back. One cup, I'm uncomfortably jittery. Two, unpleasantly agitated. So I became one of those morons, as Lucy would put it. Almost 12 months a decaf drinker now. Am I calmer? Yes. Happier? Probably. Mostly, though, I'm disappointed. It's hard, it seems, to get the same flavour without the fix. So I set out to find out why that is, and why, after more than a century of commercial production, decaf makes up just 3% of the global coffee market by volume, a figure the International Coffee Organization says has been stable for at least a decade. What are the environmental and economic challenges of taking the bounce out of a bean? Can we grow a caffeine-free coffee plant? And why can some people neck three espressos before bed and still sleep just fine, whilst just one has me staring at the ceiling all night, wondering about the meaning of it all? Our story starts on a sunny day in August at a food event where the vice president of Lavazza, one of the world's largest coffee companies, agreed to have a quick chat. At last, someone to commiserate with about the quality of decaf, I thought. The Italian heir to a long-standing coffee empire, no less. Marco Lavazza is the great-grandson of the man who founded the company over 120 years ago. But... Your brand is known for celebrating really good coffee, an Italian company. What happens when you take the caffeine out? You have a wonderful coffee as well. That's the point. You have it. You have it. Do you, though? Yes, we have it. This is a battle that my father has fought for many years. Because, like, 30 years ago, people would think about decaf coffee as you have some problem. In fact, that's what someone asked me earlier. I drink decaf coffee, and straight away the first question was, why? What kind of health problem have you got? I know, I know, I know exactly. That's what my father felt. He, for example, after 4 o'clock, 4 p.m., he, he drinks only decaf. So I was, I was raised with this, so I had, I had no, absolutely no problem with that, no problem. In your family, when you all get together, are you all drinking decaf then? No, never. Never. OK, so most Lavazzas do prefer their coffee with a bit of a kick then. Although Marco's youngest son has other ideas. He likes to, do, to prepare the coffee and he likes to put the finger inside and drink the coffee without uh, sugar, without anything. And he likes it and he's two years old. And does he drink decaf then? Yes, at the moment yet. Because at two years old, it's maybe better to don't give them too energy. Believe me. Decaf, socially acceptable in Italy. If you're a toddler. I suppose it's not surprising Marco told me there's no stigma attached to the drink. It makes up 5% of Lavazza's coffee sales, which amounts to more than a billion cups each year. So I thought I'd try someone who might have witnessed the social derision a decaf drinker can face. 
It's a few months on, and I'm in a cafe in Shoreditch, East London, waiting for a man called Josh. It's decidedly hipster. Baristas shout their orders from under seemingly regulation bushy beards. Coffee here is a serious business. And during the ten minutes I'm waiting, no one orders decaf. Josh Tarlow arrives, almost bearded. He calls himself a coffee professional. He started out 17 years ago as a barista and he's pretty good at pouring the stuff by all accounts, winning the UK Barista of the Year competition a few months ago. Now he sources coffee from around the world for Origin, a high-end coffee company and cafe chain. The company decaffeinates around 5% of its beans and Josh insists that if you order a decaf here, no one will be quietly scoffing beneath their beard. But he does agree that the drink has long been stigmatised. The cafes generally didn't take it too seriously, so they didn't really care what decaf they had. Most of the baristas wouldn't have tasted the decaf that they had, and the roastery themselves wouldn't really care too much about the decaf they have. So the stigma sort of existed within this place of people just not caring. And what about you? Because you really love coffee. You've dedicated your career, your life really, to coffee. One of the essential ingredients, surely, that makes coffee what it is, is the caffeine, the kick you get out of it. Caffeine, absolutely, I wake up in the morning and I have a coffee because I'm a bit tired. But there is this space that, like, it is just delicious. Something that we've noticed more and more, why do people go to certain cafes over others? Why have we kind of rejected more and more the super commercial chains over our small independents? And that's all taste-led, and it has... Nothing to do with the caffeine. No one, no one asks us really about the caffeine content of our coffee. So I've had very, very, very good decaf coffee. And that's just because someone made the decision to decaf a very good coffee. And so the process itself doesn't actually harm the final cup all that much. It changes it slightly, but only slightly. Could you describe what that is? Can you put your finger on it? Yes, yeah, so we find it slightly lowers acidity. So... Coffee needs acidity because acidity has a lot of those flavors that we really like in it. Um, it's a part of balancing a really nice cup. Um, so most coffee is balanced between sweetness, bitterness, and acidity. And so what we find when we're picking a coffee for decaffeination, we always ensure it has a slightly higher acidity than we would typically buy because we know that it will slightly lower once it's been decaffeinated. Why can't you just add acidity into the decaf? Um, we do find that when you add additives to coffee, it lacks harmony, if this makes sense in the cup. Um, this is going to get super uh, coffee person, but essentially the flavors feel layered. They, they, they feel like they're sitting on top of each other in this way that you almost experience them separately on your palate. Like they don't feel like a full flavor. You said this is all about taste, but this is one of the big problems with decaffeinated coffee, isn't it? Historically, it hasn't always tasted as good as real coffee. Why is that? Decaf has a lot of challenges with it, and that's primarily all the added production costs. So say we're trying to buy coffee A for because we think it tastes nice, and we can then offer it to people at a price that they find quite accessible. But then coffee B, that's going to be a decaf. If we want to make it in line with the pricing that they're familiar with, we generally actually then would have to find a lower grade coffee, a cheaper coffee that doesn't taste as nice. So from the word go, it starts out as the raw thing isn't as good because everyone's sort of mindful of the end price as well. The decaffeination process of the green coffee, that adds a whole extra step to the coffee production process. Does that mean there's a higher environmental cost to decaf? Yeah, there's so a lot of decaffeination happens in a plant in Vancouver, Canada. And so you can just imagine the shipping lines that, of that. So say you got a coffee coming from, that coffee from Columbia we talked about has to get all the way to Vancouver, Canada, and then it has to come to us. Um, we've now switched to some folks who are uh, decaffeinated in Germany, and so that much lowers the footprint. So there is absolutely a slightly higher uh, carbon footprint on decaf, and then you have the energy cost of the processing itself. And then you add into the fact that the decaffeination process means that we have to decaf quite constantly. You have to always have fresh decaf on hand. And that's because decafing the coffee will actually it will, it will make the coffee age quicker. And so that means we have to do it all the time. But there are some um, things to kind of take away to feel a bit more comfortable about that. Like the process itself has zero waste. The caffeine is sold to soda companies to make pop and stuff like that. The residue from the filters when they filter the water after the decaffeination is actually turned to cow feed and the water is reused again and again for batches. So actually there's like no waste um, from the process itself. It's purely a transport. 
and the energies uh, to, in the factory, I guess. When you go on your coffee buying trips, you're looking for coffees that will decaffeinate well. When you speak to other people in the coffee world doing similar jobs for similar roasteries, are they taking decaffeination as seriously as you are? More and more. I'm noticing that there's so many specialty coffee roasters now that we're all looking for a way to just produce the best coffee possible. So I think there's going to be a quality drive that's going to be led by the roasters. And then I think there might be perhaps the first couple roasters that make the decision to do very great high-end coffees decaf. And I'm sure that will happen at some point. Somebody's going to make that decision. It's because of how the production works, you have to decaf quite a bit of coffee. So I'm sure it's going to be slow coming, but um, it, I'm sure at some point it'll make the jump. I did try Josh's decaf and it was really good. But a bag is more than double the price of your average supermarket brand. It's becoming clear that making a good decaf at scale can be a challenge. So why bother? Why is it that some of us feel we need it? Well, this is how 19th century French writer Honoré de Balzac described drinking a cup of coffee. Straight away, there is a general commotion. Ideas begin to move like the battalions of the Grand Army of the battlefield, and the battle takes place. Things remembered arrive at full gallop, ensuing to the wind. The light cavalry of comparisons deliver a magnificent deploying charge. The artillery of logic hurry up with their train and ammunition. The shafts of wit start up like sharpshooters. Similes arise, the paper is covered with ink. For the struggle commences and is concluded with torrents of black water, just as battle with powder. I think it's safe to say he wasn't drinking decaf. I asked a scientist to explain what might have been going on in his brain. Dr Astrid Nalig is a research director at INSERM, the French National Institute of Health and Medical Research. She specialises in the effects of caffeine on the body. Caffeine is soluble in fat, which means that it easily crosses all membranes including the blood-brain barrier, and caffeine enters the brain very fast. You can already have it in the brain after two minutes. Once in the brain, caffeine blocks the work of the sleep-inducing chemical adenosine. You will feel awake, you'll have a better concentration, so you are more efficient in different tasks. Then caffeine can also stimulate respiration, then we go a bit more down to the digestive system. The caffeine that comes into your stomach might irritate you. Some people are more sensitive. This is genetically linked. It stimulates liver. It stimulates pancreas, intestinal contractions. About all over your body, you are more active. In coffee plants, caffeine is good for survival. The chemical compound acts as an insecticide, paralysing or even killing bugs that try to eat them. In humans, though, it's a bit more complicated. Drunk in moderation, coffee isn't thought to be harmful to our health. But in some of us, it leads to high levels of anxiety. So first of all, we do not metabolise caffeine at the same rate. And this is linked to a different genetic expression of the main liver enzyme, which metabolizes caffeine, which is to name it cytochrome P450, 1A2. You are either a rapid or a slow metabolizer, and the population is divided about half and half. Astrid says there are also different genetic expressions of the adenosine receptor in the brain. And this make people sensitive or insensitive to the effects of caffeine on sleep. There is also another different genetic expression of the adenosine that makes people more or less sensitive to the effects of caffeine on anxiety. So some people become jittery and nervous and aggressive, while other people just don't feel that effect at all. So for all of you self-proclaimed coffee addicts out there, don't judge a decaf drinker. We really can't hack the strong stuff. It's genetic. And 
By the way, Astrid also told me, scientifically speaking, caffeine isn't actually addictive because it doesn't activate the brain's reward circuits. You might feel dependent on it, but you'll probably get over any ill effects of withdrawal within a week. You're listening to The Food Chain on the BBC World Service with me, Emily Thomas. I've been finding out what we lose when we take the buzz out of a coffee bean. Earlier, we heard there are significant economic and environmental challenges to producing a decent decaf. I wanted to find out what someone who makes their living from decaffeination makes of that. The coffee is brought in in 150-pound jute bags. These are slashed open and then dropped into a hopper. Frank Dennis is president and CEO of Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee Company. He's taking us on an audio tour of his decaffeination plant on the outskirts of Vancouver, Canada. It receives coffee beans from all over the world, from South America to Africa to Southeast Asia. The hopper then sends the coffee into a cleaning station where we remove dust, chaff, coins, metal bullets, whatever that comes out of origin. Uh, before we go into the green coffee silos in preparation for decaffeination. Yes, you did just hear that. Frank has found bullets in his coffee. The beans are taken to a decaffeination tank where 99.9% of the caffeine is removed using a special chemical-free solution. Coffee will drop in and then green coffee extract is brought on top of the coffee and seeps down through the green coffee, removing caffeine as it goes. Stepping away from the noise of the factory floor, Frank told me that there are just a few decaffeination plants around the world that use water for extraction, and that some use CO2. But most of the world's decaf coffee is chemically processed. Some think that this is the best method for preserving flavour, but not Frank. Almost 80% of coffee around the world is decaffeinated using methylene chloride, which is, for example, a a core component of paint stripper. So in the methylene chloride process, the coffee is uh, steamed, it enlarges, and then methylene chloride is introduced into that coffee directly. It's very simple. And when the coffee is at temperature and slightly enlarged from the steam, uh, the methylene chloride attaches to caffeine and then can be pulled out of the coffee. And then the coffee gets re-steamed again to remove most of the methylene chloride, um, but there is still absolutely a residual. We should point out there isn't robust science showing that decaffeinated drinks produced using the methylene chloride method do have any negative impact on health. No, there is no direct negative impact. Is there a risk in one cup of coffee? No. Is there risk in 500 cups of coffee? I don't know. I don't know. Consumers, we believe, when they know that a coffee has been decaffeinated with methylene chloride, they choose a chemical-free process every time. So, for example, in Canada, where it is required by law on roast and ground packages or instant packages of coffee that have been decaffeinated using methylene chloride or ethyl acetate, that you need to disclose to the consumer that you're using that chemical versus if you're using Swiss water process or CO2, you don't have to disclose the consumer. So in Canada, our share is almost 70% because many roasters don't want to use those chemicals because they don't want to tell the consumer that they're using those chemicals because consumers don't prefer them. So why is 80% of the decaffeinated coffee in the world produced through the chemical method? Because it's a lot less expensive. The process involves several additional steps uh, versus methylene chloride. Methylene chloride is very, very simple. The other major difference is that we cannot capture caffeine in our process. So in methylene chloride, there is another revenue stream from caffeine which gets sold to beverage manufacturers. What about the environmental impact of all of this? Your plant's quite a long distance from most coffee producers. So The beans are typically travelling a long way to you before then being transported all over the world to consumers. So why are there so few facilities like this? It is a a big capital cost. It's, It's not easy. And in terms of moving coffee around the world, all coffee gets moved around the world, all by boat. It's not flown. And if you can be closer to the consumer, you are providing a lower carbon footprint as opposed to 
being closer to where the coffee is grown because then you can have various types of coffee arriving at one facility versus only one origin or one type emanating from a facility. So there is one additional step for decaffeination. Lots of companies have this extra cost when they decaffeinate, so they make up for that by buying a less good bean in the first place. Do you see the major chains that are your customers bringing in a poorer quality bean than they might give to their caffeine drinking customers? As a whole, yes, unfortunately, um, that still exists. However, there is a movement towards the recognition that the decaffeinated coffee consumer is in fact your most loyal coffee consumer in that they might be there in the morning for the caffeine, but then they're back in the afternoon to have a drink that doesn't have caffeine. I'm a decaf drinker. I drink a lot of it. When I look on the back of a packet, I can never see how my coffee's been decaffeinated. Do you think that this is something that should be labelled? Well, I do know that in Canada, the consumer appreciates knowing. I also know that in Korea and Japan, methylene chloride is uh, completely banned for decaffeination. And um, we think that there is uh, value in being able to recognize where your food products have been. Do you think it should be compulsory, though? I think that there's value in it, yes. I'd like to know more about the decaf I drink, but in most countries, including the US and the UK, there's no legal requirement to state the decaffeination method on the label. And when it comes to some of the large high street chains, it's all a bit of a mystery. An example for you. When we asked Starbucks how they decaffeinate their coffee, they could only tell us the green coffee is decaffeinated by third-party providers on behalf of Starbucks using a number of industry standard processes. It's becoming clear why this has been such a disappointing coffee drinking year for me. Decaf often has a higher carbon footprint than its buzzy relative and because it costs more to process, some roasters are picking inferior beans. So wouldn't it just be easier to go back to the very beginning of the production process and develop a caffeine-free coffee plant? Well, they do exist. The trouble is, although they're zero or very low in caffeine, they taste disgusting. Dr Aaron Davis is in charge of coffee research at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew here in London, one of the world's leading plant research centres. And he's suffered in the name of science. So when you taste one of these coffees, which are sometimes found in uh, street markets in Madagascar, for example, they are extremely acidic. I've tried quite a few, um, and you don't want to try them again <laughs> once you've consumed them. Can't we breed a coffee which has got no caffeine but doesn't have these unpalatable acids you were talking about? Knocking out some of the chemicals in the pathway that make caffeine alters the chemistry of the bean and thus the, the taste. And it's not easy just to knock out a single chemical or a range of chemicals associated with caffeine. So it's a very difficult thing to do. But do you think basically we just don't want to do this enough? After you decaffeinate, you've got a very valuable commodity coming out of it, caffeine. So we just haven't tried hard enough to develop this caffeine-free coffee plant. I think if there was a real need to do this and a real market demand, people would be investing more money in it. And low-caffeine coffees are available. The trouble is they are not very productive and that puts the price up and that puts people off. If you look at what was being written about this about a decade ago or, or 20 years ago, it seemed like there was a lot of hope and a lot of investment into caffeine-free coffee plants. There was a huge, uh, huge amount of interest on caffeine-free or low-caffeine Arabica based on collections made in Ethiopia in the 1960s. Uh, this work was done in Hawaii and Brazil. The trouble was that when they were grown in coffee fields, the caffeine simply reappeared. Why did the caffeine reappear? Because when you're looking at the, a single coffee bean, it might have absolutely no caffeine, but there are thousands of beans on each tree, and there might be a freak bean with no caffeine, but generally those beans had the same amount of caffeine as they always did. Is anyone still investing substantial amounts of money in developing caffeine-free coffee plants? No. No. It's over. I don't think it's over. I think there is I think there is a market demand. We read a lot of 
press releases about studies of caffeine and health, and that's all very well. But I think the elephant in the room are other uh, effects of caffeine, and particularly anxiety. When it comes to anxiety, is part of the problem that it's hard to know how much caffeine is in your coffee? That's a very good point, and I think many consumers of coffee are totally unaware of how much caffeine they're consuming in each cup. And depending on the type of coffee used and the way it's made, there can be a huge difference. You might drink two cups and exceed your daily recommended allowance, or you might drink four cups and be under. So I I do think there is a a place in the market for a caffeine-free coffee. Whether anybody wants to invest a huge amount of money into it is another thing. I've spoken to coffee sector representatives, you know, the larger companies, and it's quite clear that a caffeine is a very valuable byproduct of decaffeination. It's a high value sector, high energy drinks, for example, but also pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. Uh, it's widely used in the drug industry as a, an additive to, to um, a whole range of drug products. That said, in five years' time, there might be a shift, uh, you know, particularly with in- increasing evidence around anxiety and other health issues. Well, here's hoping. In the meantime, I am going to stick with decaf, but I'll be looking a little closer at where it's been before it reached my cup. Let us know what you think. Tweet using the hashtag BBC Food Chain, or I'm at Emily Thomas BBC. From me and the rest of the team, Simon Tulett, Sarah Stollarts and Sarah Parry, thanks for listening and join us again for The Food Chain next week.